All right, we get to start our first official system now. We're out of all the molecules and molecular stuff and reactions, and we're still going to bring that information forward into the systems, but now we're going to get into some things, hopefully, that are a little bit more familiar to you, but of course, we're going to examine the more advanced concepts of these systems that are, you know, a little higher level than what you saw in general a and And some of it might be some review for general A&P, because not everybody um, had the same instructor for general a &P, so it's hard to know what depth you went into. So anyway, looking at just the kind of generic overview of the reproductive system, the gonads are the terms we use for both the male and female reproductive organs, and those are the testes and the ovaries, and they produce gametes, which are sperm and egg, and their other job is to secrete hormones, and they're steroid hormones, which means they're based on cholesterol, they're lipid soluble. So we talked about with the endocrine system how those hormones are made. Remember, they're made on demand, so they're not stored. They're made on demand. The um, stimulation for that is um, through the FSH and LH, and those are the gonadotropins, remember? And what stimulates FSH and, well, first of all, what, what organ secretes FSH and LH? Anterior pituitary. And what organ stimulates the release of FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary? The hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is really boss over the reproductive system because if it doesn't stimulate its hormone, then the rest of the process can't continue. So we can't get estrogen and testosterone without FSH and LH, and we can't get FSH and LH without the hypothalamus secreting its hormone, which is GnRH. So it's capital G, little n, capital R, capital H, and that stands for gonadotropin releasing hormone. So the gonadotropins are FSH and LH, so if they are stimulated by the hypothalamus, they're in turn going to stimulate the ovaries and the testes. So the ovaries produce two hormones, progesterone and estrogen, and the testes produce testosterone. And depending on the needs of the body and where we are in the uterine cycle, um, we have different levels of progesterone and estrogen secretion, and we'll talk about that when we get into the specific systems. So looking at your um, review, assignment is just looking at the reproductive organs, reviewing the anatomy. So if you haven't done that in a while, make sure you do review the anatomy. I have some pictures here today, too, for that purpose. So the sex hormones, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, those really are key to developing sperm and egg and developing the reproductive system organs and the tracts. And sexual behavior and sex drives, we call that libido. The urge to have intercourse is called libido. And it really depends on levels of sex hormones. So as we age, sex hormone levels go down in women after menopause, and men a slower decline. They can still, they do still have some testosterone secretion, but it's much less than, say, a man in his 20s and 30s. So as a result, that uh, drive for intercourse goes down. And that works with everything else because reproductive ability is also gone um, in women and reduced in men, so there's less desire and less capability for reproduction. So when we look at the other tissues, so not only do these hormones act on just, you know, uh, sperm and egg development, but they also act on other organs and tissues. Like we know that estrogen is important for bone, right, for bone strength, and women after menopause are at risk for osteoporosis. So not only do we see that just locally in the reproductive system, but estrogen has other important effects as well. And testosterone, we know, also acts on other tissues. Like if you look during puberty, especially when testosterone levels are increasing, we see the big you know, change in height in boys. And same thing in girls. So estrogen, uh, we know, acts on bone to make it hard, but it also contributes to the growth we see in puberty as well as testosterone. So here's just a little bit of an overview of what you've already reviewed, hopefully, prior to today. But the testes are housed within the scrotal sac outside the body because ideal sperm development is at a slightly lower temperature than body temperature. 
so they're housed outside the body. And there's muscles and ligaments within the spermatic cord that control the height of the scrotal sac. And when it's warmer, the testes hang further from the body. And the scrotal sac lies further away from the body to cool the testes. And if it's cold, then that muscle pulls the testes in the scrotal sac tighter to the body to keep them a little bit warmer. So the uh, sperm development is temperature sensitive. <coughs> Not the case in females. Egg is inside the body and that occurs at the same you know, temperature as the rest of the body. So. so when we look at the duct system then, so the organ of the reproductive system is the testes, but the duct system that delivers the sperm to the outside for fertilization of the female, the duct system, the first the beginning of where sperm is produced is in the seminiferous tubules, right? And then from there, it goes to this structure here, which is the epididymis. And from the epididymis, it goes to the ductus deferens, which goes up over the bladder, comes down and becomes the ejaculatory duct here as it passes. Here's the um, seminiferous, or the, uh, um, oh my gosh, seminal vesicle. So the seminal vesicle, when it secretes its content into the semen, then the ductus deferens becomes the ejaculatory duct. And then from there, this is all urethra because the bladder is here. So normally this passageway is for urine, but during intercourse and ejaculation, we have semen passing through here. So this gland just below the bladder is the prostate and the urethra passes through that so we call this portion the prostatic urethra and then as it passes toward the pelvic wall and outside the body we have the membranous urethra and then the penile urethra but only in the male reproductive tract do we see a common passageway for both the reproductive secretions of semen and of the urinary uh, system which is urine we don't see that in the female. So the accessory ducts are the passageways, the glands are the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and the bulbourethral gland, which is right down here at the base, just at the start of the membranous urethra. And we'll talk about all those functions today. So if we look at the blood supply to the testes, there's arteries and veins that supply blood to the testes because those are cells that need oxygen and nutrients just like any other cell. And that is housed within the spermatic cord which has nerve fibers and lymphatics um, to drain excess fluid from the testes. And because of that, because the testes are subject to gravity, and in elderly men with failing hearts, the scrotal sac is a space for excess fluid to fill. And those of you that maybe work in long-term care, you've seen the, the size of the scrotum in, a, in an elderly gentleman with excess fluid and a failing heart. They can be the size of a softball, even a volleyball. I mean, it's incredible how much fluid that can be held there. And obviously, when there's that much fluid there, the urinary tract is not open and functioning, so those patients typically end up in the hospital and need, you know, diuretics and things to get rid of that excess fluid. So a lot of detail here. So we're going to talk about a couple of different things. We talked about the scrotal sac and how it's three degrees uh, less than degrees Celsius, lower than body temperature. Um, and also, if we look at these tubular structures here, the seminiferous tubules, we've analyzed that quite a bit in lab when we looked at spermatogenesis. Remember at the outer edge of the seminiferous tubule has those spermatogonia, which then become spermatids, you know, primary and secondary spermatocytes, then spermatids and spermatozoa. And then they're released and they travel through this bridge from here to the epididymis, and this is called the reet testis. It's just a bridge between the seminiferous tubules and the epididymis. So as it passes through there, then it is stored, these sperm are stored and matured in the tail of the epididymis. So this is where the, the, the sperm will stay and mature until they're ready for ejaculation. So because of this tubular, because this tubular system is isolated from the blood, so they're, they're well protected, these sperm are well protected inside of the tubules, they're not exposed to the blood supply. They're not expo exposed to the plasma and the capillaries. 
And when do these sperm show up? When we studied gametogenesis, when do the sperm show up in the seminiferous tubule? At what age? Ish. Puberty. So 12, 13, 14. When, at what age do the eggs show up in the female? They're always there, right? Fetal development. So when babies are born and their immune system is developing and the, and the immune cells, the antibodies are forming and recognizing foreign from self, in females, the eggs are considered self, right? So when they show up in the fallopian tube and are ovulated out of the ovary, there's, there's not, they're not considered foreign. They've been there since birth. But what about if sperm would enter into the general tissue, sterile tissues of the male? The body doesn't recognize those because the immune system develops in childhood and, and you know, babyhood, and the sperm aren't there until 12, 13 years old. So there is something we call the blood testes barrier. And we'll talk about that when we get to the next diagram. It shows just the, the space. There's, there's no space between the cells that line and form the seminiferous tubule because we need to keep that separate so we don't have antibodies forming. Because if a person forms antibodies to their own sperm, the antibodies are going to clump those sperm together and they're not going to be able to swim. And we do see this happen when a man has a vasectomy where they cut the ductus deferens here and they do it down in the scrotal sac region, so it's an outpatient procedure done in a doctor's office, but they'll cut that. And if they cut that, those sperm are still produced, right? So it's not affecting the um, testosterone production, it's not affecting sperm production, but the sperm just can't continue on the duct pathway because it's been cut. But what happens to those sperm then? They're exposed to the tissues of the male and the immune cells, the antibodies, and as a result, the, the male can, you know, respond to that and, and cause clumping. So that would initiate a, an immune reaction and break through that, obviously, that blood testes barrier. So let's talk about the epididymis. Biggest thing is storage. This is where stir, sperm are stored after they're created. And there's fluid in the um, seminiferous tubule that transports the sperm to the epididymis. So that excess testicular fluid is absorbed and nutrients are passed to the sperm, allowing them to mature. So they remain in the epididymis up until ejaculation and specifically in the tail of the epididymis. So they gain their their wings here in the epididymis, <laughs> their tail, right? But they have a tail, but they gain the motility in the epididymis. So prior to um, entering the epididymis, they're not completely mobile where they can travel up the reproductive tract yet. And then there's some other things that need to happen along the way as well. So they pass through the series of ducts to, to gain more energy. And we'll talk about each of those structures. So these accessory ducts, they, um, that there's some there's the ducts that form the reproductive tract so we talked about it kind of trace those through and then there's the tissues so there's spongy tissue that forms the, the the shaft of the penis and there's uh, spongiosum and cavernosum you talked about that in general A&P so we're not going to go into that in detail but just keep in mind again this is kind of a front view here the ductus deferens is what's cut during a vasectomy and if you look at the location of the prostate, right below the bladder, and it encircles the urethra, right as it leaves the bladder. So it's very common, up to 80% of men, I think, over the age of 65 or 70, have some enlargement of the prostate. How is that going to affect them when it comes to urination? Makes it difficult, yeah, yeah. And we call that benign prostatic hypertrophy, which or BPH is what we call that in the clinical environment. And hypertrophy is just a fancy word for getting bigger. So benign means it's not cancer, it's just a, an enlarged prostate. So um, some men have trouble with urination, and when they strain to urinate, it makes it even more enlarged and more constricted. So we tell people not to strain when they're trying to urinate. But it's important that we be aware of that because if you have a person that say is on a 
diuretic when trying to get rid of excess fluid and they've got an enlarged prostate and we're trying to, to wait for them to fill up that bag of that Foley, you know, the catheter if we have them on a, on a medicine to get them urinating a lot, um, they may not be able to empty their bladder completely. And that's dangerous, isn't it? So the, we're kicking in the kidneys with this medicine and it's filling up the bladder, but they can't empty the bladder. That can be very dangerous because where is that urine going to go? It's going to back up into the ureters and it could back up into the kidneys, increasing pressure in the kidneys and do kidney damage. So we really need to be careful. If we put someone on a medicine, we better look for urination, you know, increased urination, either in the potty hat or the, the urinal or the Foley bag. So it's important, again, understanding your anatomy as a nurse or healthcare person is going to help you take better care of your patient and know what to look for. So that's where you say, okay, he hasn't peed a lot, either the kidneys are not functioning or it's backed up in the bladder. So what do we do to check which one is which? The least invasive, we're not going to run kidney tests or call, you know, bladder scan. Yeah, we have a Doppler just like they use on women when they're, you know, lo looking for heartbeats and, you know, doing an ultrasound. We have a little ultrasound scanner that we use on the floors in hospitals that look for fluid in the bladder and then it measures. So and then you know if it's excess, usually like over 300 milliliters, but it depends. The doctor will put an order in. Then you have to, what would we do if it was full and when they can't pee? What are we going to do? Yep, put a catheter. And that's a straight catheter. So it's a catheter that's not permanent. This is a person that doesn't already have a catheter, right? Um, they wouldn't have a problem. If you had a catheter in there, that's who would get a catheter, right? Is someone who can't urinate on their own. But if they're not peeing on their own, and they're full based on the bladder scan, then you put a straight cath up there and keep going until you hit the, the jackpot, which is urine flow through the tube, then you know you're in, and then keep it in place and empty that bladder. And the goal is to get them to go, so um, we don't keep catheters in long term if we can avoid it. Some people need them long term, but we try to just do it intermittently if possible. But there's special catheters that have a pointed tip so you don't damage that enlarged area by ramming a catheter up through there. So you have to be really careful. And it can be quite painful for men that have an enlarged prostate. But if it's cancer, then we look for this, uh, one of the antigens that is released, one of the chemicals released by the prostate, which is PSA, prostate, um, oh my gosh, I forgot what it stands for now. Specific antigen, thank you. Prostate specific antigen. Um, and then if we see excess levels in the blood, then we know this is not a benign swelling. There's cells that are dividing out of control and secreting excess PSA. So we do a blood test, and if it's really elevated, we watch it, we look. If it's elevated indicating cancer, then we remove it. So now we have the other scenario. You have a patient in the hospital that had prostate cancer, and it's been removed. What's their issue going to be, do you think? You take this prostate away from the urethra, and now it's just kind of flopping out there. Yeah, they have trouble controlling urination. So when they feel the urge to go, now you gave them this medicine to make them pee, now they feel the urge to go, and whoa, it's coming down the line, right? It's coming down the urethra, so they have trouble with dribbling and controlling their flow. So those people need to have something nearby, so when they feel the urge to go, they can go right away. Or some people will put a small pad in their underwear just to prevent that dribbling that can occur. So that's the other side of it. Yes? So is there anything you can do aside from removing it to, you know, to make it longer or better? No, no. It's just there's nothing really there, you know, to, to support it once it's removed. So, yeah. So there are, you know, when people have prostate cancer and they say, you know, it's been successfully removed, how could they confirm that it was, that every cell was gone? Yeah, check a PSA level. The PSA level should be? Ideally, if you removed it, zero, zero right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the first accessory glands. So sperm are made in the seminal vesicle. They're stored in the epididymis. Ejaculation is occurring now that the sperm are entering into the duct system. So the seminal vesicle is the first gland that's going to secrete excess fluid, not excess, extra, extra fluid into this duct system. So we're right here, we're looking at the seminal vesicle. There's a pair of them on either side. 
So we have the semen coming up, coming down. The ductus deferens widens here, and then the seminal vesicle secretes its contents into the ejaculatory duct and then into the urethra. So if we look at this particular secretion, it's 70% of the volume of semen. So if a person has a vasectomy, are they going to produce less semen? Not really, because if you look at the other percentages, it's like 5%. Uh, they don't list a percent for the prostate, but most of the semen volume comes from the seminal vesicle, the bulbar urethral gland, and then the prostate. So very little volume is in that epididymis. So it's concentrated sperm with a little bit of fluid there. So what a person may notice after vasectomy is that the semen is not as milky white because there's less cell, there shouldn't be any cells in there, right? If it was done effectively, there shouldn't be any sperm in there. So it would be a little more clear in appearance, but volume isn't gonna change. Um, okay, so 70% of the volume, and what is in the seminal vesicles, this is what you're going to be accountable for now in advanced AMP. In general, you just talked about it, and you may have had to know that it was most of the volume of semen, but what's in it is fructose. What is, what is that? A sugar. It's a simple sugar, monosaccharide, so it's readily usable. So that's going to provide energy to that sperm. Asorbic acid, does anybody know what that is? Vitamin C. Vitamin C, so that's for metabolism, helping that. And coagulating enzyme. The name of that enzyme is vesiculase. So vesiculase is going to coagulate. That means when the sperm are first ejaculated, they coagulate, they clump. And what is the benefit of clumping up the sperm as they leave the male reproductive tract? <laughs> Teamwork, promoting, <laughs> yeah, no one gets to leave. Yeah, no, um, just so they don't spill out of the re female reproductive tract right away. So they have a chance to get in there, break free, and then take off on the rest of their journey. So vesiculase is a, a coagulating enzyme. And then prostaglandins. And prostaglandins actually benefit the female because they cause mild contractions of the vaginal and uterine, the vaginal canal and uterine, and uterus. And in the process of intercourse, women find that a pleasurable experience. So it stimulates the female to receive the semen as far as being a pleasurable experience having the mild contractions, but it also, those mild contractions go upward. So we call it reverse contractions or reverse peristalsis. So it's pushing the sperm up where they need to go. So it's beneficial, those prostaglandins. But prostaglandins also, do you remember what we talked about? What's the bad thing about prostaglandins? What? Pain, yeah. So that's the bad part about prostaglandins, is they can cause pain, not in the vaginal canal, but if they would be, um, if they would end up in the um, uterine canal, or not canal, the uterus, that can be painful. So most of the prostaglandins remain down in the vaginal canal. And like I said, causing those contractions, which is a good thing to move this, the sperm upward. So then, like I said, that moves into the ejaculatory duct. And what's interesting, if you look at my notes pages under this, underneath this slide, is there's a yellow pigment in the seminal fluid that they can use at crime scenes. When they shine UV light on it, it glows, and they can detect that at crime scenes or you know, looking for signs of rape and things like that. So that's the, those are the seminal vesicles. And then the prostate, we already talked about where it's located. Um, it secretes a milky, slightly acidic fluid because it contains citrate, and citrate is also known as citric acid. And citric acid is what gives things kind of a, like you see them in our sodas that are kind of sour tasted, sour tasting because of the acid. So that's citric acid. And it contains other enzymes to help nourish the sperm and that PSA we talked about. So it plays a role, like I said, in activating sperm and it enters 
during ejaculation as it comes down the, the duct. So the citrate we said was a nutrient source. A couple of enzymes, so in the notes pages underneath your slide, fibrinolysin. Fibrinolysin is, this, is the enzyme that's going to break down that coagulation that we saw due to the vesiculates. So fibrinolysin is going, that's one of the enzymes that's going to um, make the sperm break free and be able to swim individually. And there's another, another enzyme, hyaluronidase, and that helps the sperm break through. Remember those cells around the secondary oocyte as it's ovulated? It needs to break through those corona radiata. That enzyme dissolves those, helps dissolve those cells. And then uh, acid phosphatase is another one listed there, and that breaks through the acidity because semen do, sperm do not like acidic conditions. So that helps the sperm, helps activate the sperm and keep them alive because acidic conditions are damaging to sperm. Because that head of the sperm has an acrosome coating, which is an enzyme that's going to also help penetrate through the zona pellucida. And it needs an, a, a basic environment to maintain that acrosome, that head. So this other enzyme, the acid phosphatase, um, keeps the, the sperm in that basic, that pH greater than 7. <coughs> And then the PSA, prostate-specific antigen, um, also helps to liquefy the semen. So when a person is, when a couple is having trouble conceiving, it's not always the female that is having trouble, right? You know, multiple miscarriages, yeah, that can happen. But sometimes if they're just having trouble conceiving and they can't find anything wrong with the female, they'll do a semen analysis in the male. And they'll look for things like, what is the sperm count? You know, there's anywhere from two to five mils of semen. Is there an adequate volume? What is the count? And I think I have a number in there. What is it, 25 to 50 million, something like that, in one ejaculate? So they'll look at the semen count. They'll look at the motility. Do the sperm all swim forward? Do they have proper tail movement to make the, the, the journey up the reproductive tract? They'll look at, does it coagulate when it's first ejaculated and then does it dissolve within a reasonable amount of time to allow the, the, the sperm to swim free. So they look at all those things. So a man will have to provide a semen sample and he'll have to provide it whatever way he wants to provide it. It can be at home or in the clinic and then they'll analyze those things. And sometimes they can correct it or most times what they'll do if there's a, if a, an issue with swimming, then they will do a very low intervention um, technique where they, the man provides the semen sample and they wash it, they get rid of the prostaglandins, they choose the best swimming sperm, they put it in a syringe with a long, thin, flexible tube and they insert that into the female and then they just push that semen up into the uterus. So they just helped it half, you know, go half the journey, but, and how much does that cost? About 500 bucks. So it's cheap. If, you know, so if the male has the issue, it's cheap to correct, right? If the female has the issue, then sometimes we have to do, you know, um, art of, you know in vitro fertilization, and that's very expensive. Then we're talking $20,000. But sometimes correcting some of these swimming issues can be, you know, a simple procedure. And we call that, I have to remember what that's called. Um, oh, gosh, it'll come to me. But anyway... Um, that's an easy way to overcome sperm that don't swim well. Okay, so the next gland that we're going to look at, the accessory glands, the bulbourethral gland or Cowper's glands. The interesting thing about this gland is this is secreted prior to ejaculation. So prior to complete ejaculation, we have a little bit small amount of secretion that occurs from these bulbourethral glands. And if we look back at our PowerPoint, the bulbourethral glands are these small glands here right before the beginning of the membranous urethra. So they secrete their contents, just a, a small amount, into the urethra, and it's an alkaline. So if you think of, if we look at that, it's a thick, alkaline, clear mucus. So that is going to neutralize any acidic urine that was in that urethra prior to ejaculation. So that's going to, you know, um, neutralize that. And 
the small amount that is released, it is a mucus that provides moisture at the tip for easier insertion into the female. So it lubricates the end of the penis to make it easier for insertion. Now they have looked though, and in some cases, some men will have some um, sperm in that secretion. So ejaculation is not always completely, you know, one or the other. You have the Cowper's gland, then you have the rest. Not always. They have found some sperm in that Cowper's gland, that early secretion that maybe entered into the tract. How it happened, I don't know. And the reason why that's significant is for people that rely on the withdrawal method, that that's not a reliable method because there is, there has been um, sperm found in that early secretion. Okay, so we talked about semen then. Semen is a mixture of sperm and all those accessory glands working together to nourish the sperm, help it make its way up the reproductive tract. And we talked about that reverse peristalsis that um, happens in the uterus as a result of those prostaglandins. And another thing is the mucus in the cervix changes throughout a woman's cycle. And we're gonna talk about that in the other part of our class today. but. Um, viscosity refers to thickness. So a fluid that's very viscous is something like molasses. It has a high viscosity. Something that is very low viscosity would be like water. It pours and flows really easily. So these prostaglandins decrease the viscosity. It makes that cervical mucus thinner. Because if you have thick, sticky cervical mucus, and the cervix is the opening to the uterus and the female, so if the sperm are encountering this thick, sticky mucus, they're not gonna be able to break free either, right? So that's one of the things that those prostaglandins do as well. So here's my reference of how much. Two to five mils of semen, 20 to 50, 150 million sperm per mil, per mil. So if there's five mils, that's a lot of sperm. How many sperm do we need to make a zygote? One. One, it's amazing that we're you know, not as fertile as you'd think with all this set up for success. But that pathway is still you know, a, a rocky pathway going from the entrance up to where fertilization occurs, which is where? In the fallopian tube is where they meet. So there's a, that number is drastically reduced by the time you get up to the fallopian tube. Okay, so there in semen there's also some enzymes that destroy bacteria, so it prevents infection. And we talked about the clotting factors and all that, so those antibiotic chemicals are important because in the female, I mean, the, the vaginal canal is, you know, has a stratified squamous epithelium, good mucus production, um, you know, um, immune cells as well to prevent infection, but having semen also having antibiotics in it as well just prevents infection. Now, of course, we have STDs, but that's a whole different topic. So now we're gonna talk about these cells then. We'll go back to the beginning now, how this whole process started. We have these cells that line the walls of the seminiferous tubules, and we call those sustentacular cells, kind of a fancy name, or we can just call them Sertoli. I think Sertoli is easier to say, so that's what I'm gonna use today as Sertoli cells. They both start with an S. So these are the big cells, that's what makes up the seminiferous tubule. So if you look at what's the brick and mortar of the seminiferous tubule, it's these Sertoli cells, tightly bound to one another. So their job is to house these cells. So everything you see in yellow here, this is a Sertoli cell. Okay, the big yellow rectangle here, just think of it as a Sertoli cell. So here's the nucleus of that cell. So we have a big cell with smaller cells embedded in the middle of it. And this is where the meiosis is occurring that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. So we have the, the spermatogonium in here that are near the edge of this cell, at the top of the cell, and then the lumen, the inside of the seminiferous tubule is here. So the job of these Sertoli cells is to support spermatogenesis. And we're not gonna go into that because we talked about all that stuff already. But there's tight junctions between these cells. So these cells are tight up against one another. There's no space between them. So there's no interstitial fluid between these cells 
for those immune factors to be hanging out, for the antibodies, right? We just said the blood testes barrier. The, there's tight junctions between these cells to keep them close together and not um, being invaded by immune cells like antibodies. So this is the process that's occurring inside the Sertoli cells. We're not going to go into a lot of detail there. But if we look back at these cells, so maybe you can draw, yeah, just, just draw a picture some, or draw an arrow somewhere in the middle of the cell out here to write a couple of different notes. And one is, is the Sertoli cells secrete two hormones. One hormone is called inhibin. It's I-N-H-I-B-I-N, like inhibit. Instead, the enzyme is to inhi is inhibin. So what do you think it does to sperm production if, you, if it secretes inhibin? Stops it, right? It inhibits sperm production. And the other one is androgen binding protein. And we'll talk about that when we get a little bit further on. But again, those tight junctions, which is here, so maybe you can highlight this here. This is a tight junction between these two cells. So if we look at one cell, for example, so here's a cell, and you can see it kind of goes this way and this way and comes down, and that's that cell. So there's two adjacent cells here with tight junctions tethering them tight together. So these do not divide. Otherwise, there would be no seminiferous tubule, right? Because they form the wall of the seminiferous tubule. So these do not divide, these big, those, the big yellow cell you see there. They stay there. Their job is to support those inner cells, the spermatogonium, and make them into sper sperma uh, spermatozoa. So they secrete a little bit of testicular fluid. They produce those two hormones. And then when is inhibin released? If you look at your notes pages on that slide, when the sperm count is greater than 20, millions per, 20 million sperm per mil, then inhibin is released by the Sertoli cells into the blood. And when that's released into the blood, the hypothalamus does not secrete its hormone, which is GnRH, we can abbreviate it, GnRH is decreased. So when inhibin enters the blood and binds to the cells on the hypothalamus, it suppresses or inhibits GnRH secretion. And without GnRH, the anterior pituitary will not secrete FSH and LH. Right which will not act on the seminiferous tubules to make more sperm, right? So that's how that works. It's negative feedback, right? Because we see sperm count rising, the body responds, and sperm count no longer rises. Okay, so when they are formed to when they can actually have complete ability to swim is about 24 days, but then they have to mature in the epididymis, so it's about 72 days from beginning to end. So if a couple wants to conceive, a um, couple of things we know, decreased sperm count, and that is um, nicotine, um, marijuana are two things that decrease sperm count. And so let's say a couple says, well, we're going to quit smoking and both. I'm going to quit smoking cigarettes <laughs> and marijuana, and we're going to try to conceive. Well, it's going to take, you know, two to three months to start fresh and have healthy sperm. And there are certain things out there that people say, certain nutritional factors that help sperm development. So couples that are having trouble conceiving or maybe having low sperm count, there's certain you know, vitamins they recommend men take. But again, it's gonna take you know, two to three months to really influence sperm. Or let's say a couple you know, um, wants to go on a vacation and he spends, they spend the weekend in the hot tub in their hotel room. Well, the hot tub is not good for sperm production, right? Because the temperature needs to be lower than body temperature. So if you're spending a weekend, if a man's spending a weekend in the hot tub, that's going to impact sperm production. So it's going to take, so they, that may have destroyed a lot of the viable sperm, so it's going to take 72 days to get a fresh batch available for conceiving. But on the flip side of that, just like any disclaimer on the television, is that a form of birth control hanging out in the hot tub? No. Smoking marijuana and cigarettes? No. <laughs> so other things and then in my notes pages there that can decrease or cause abnormal sperm, antibiotics, specifically antibiotic tetracycline, 
radiation, obviously, um, lead, marijuana, excessive alcohol, high heat, and obviously hormonal imbalances. So looking at sperm, major parts, whoops, um, the head, mid-piece, tail, which part enters the female egg and the, the secondary oocyte? Just the head, because the neck is in charge of energizing the sperm, so that's where the mitochondria are for the metabolic reactions, Krebs cycle, right, electron transport chain, that's happening in the neck, but that's not necessary. Once that, that nucleus has entered into the egg, the tail, the neck are not necessary, so those are gone, and just the nucleus is what enters into that ovum. And then the two fuse, and, the, and how many chromosomes are in this head? 23. So one set of the pair that this male got from his mom and dad, one set is in that sperm. And it's a combination of his mom and dad, right, because of things like what happens in prophase 1, crossing over, right? Metaphase one, random assortment, independent assortment, okay? So a lot of genetic variation. Individual sperm, you know, have a lot of different genes from the mom and dad of this male that produced the sperm. Okay, so the head is where all the action is as far as getting into that egg and fertilizing. So let's talk about testosterone now. <clears throat> testosterone comes from cholesterol. Like I said, the sex hormones are all steroids. And where are, what secretes it? What secretes the testosterone? Do you remember the cells that secrete testosterone? Yeah, interstitial cells. Another name for interstitial cells are Leydig cells, L-E-Y-D-I-G, Leydig cells. So their job is to secrete testosterone. And testosterone, um, some of the effects on the body for testosterone. Oops, wrong direction. Um, it affects spermatogenesis, stimulates those Sertoli cells to do their job, and increases protein synthesis. And what that means when we talk about multiple anabolic effects throughout the body, anabolic means building something bigger from something smaller, right? So we call any time we're making new tissues like cartilage, bone, muscle, which is what testosterone does, that's protein synthesis, right? because that's all made of protein. So testosterone increases protein synthesis in multiple areas around the body. So as boys enter puberty and they have increased testosterone levels, we see increased muscle mass, we see increased bone growth, a broader jaw, we'll see an enlargement of the Adam's apple because of the cartilage, and because of that, uh, it deepens the voice, so the, the passageway uh, gets larger, which causes um, less vibration of the vocal cords as that passageway gets larger, so we see increased cartilage there. And that's why people take artificial testosterone, right? Steroids for building muscle, because they want to increase that protein synthesis, get that muscle mass up. So prior to puberty, though, testosterone is pretty low level. We need testosterone early in development to, to develop the testes in the male penis, but after that, very low secretion of testosterone during childhood. So the testes are small, undeveloped, non-functional. So only at um, puberty do we see an e this big increase. As men age, though, we start to see a slight decrease then. About 45 to 50 years old is where we see less testosterone secretion. And testosterone is um, actually converted to estrogen by fat cells. So some of the circulating estrogen, in a, there is circulating estrogen in a man's body, is from testosterone that was converted by an enzyme in fat cells. So men do contain, have both estrogen and testosterone. There's also um, estrogen secreted by the adrenal cortex in males. So moving on to the female reproductive tract then, the accessory ducts for the female, uterine tube, uterus, and vagina, and the major organ, again, is the ovaries. And the ovaries, their job is to make the, the gametes, the oocytes. And then after fertilization, the oocyte is called a an 
Anybody remember? After fertilization, the secondary oocyte is called an ovum, ovum, okay? So uh, the hormones are estrogen and progesterone that are secreted by the ovaries. So a little bit of review here. We have the opening into the reproductive tract is the vaginal canal. It's a muscular walled canal. And then the uterus is this three-layered organ that houses the developing fetus. But the opening to the uterus is this curved structure called the cervix. So when sperm enter the reproductive tract, they go through the vagina, through the cervix, into the uterus, and then up into the fallopian tubes. And there's two fallopian tubes, one on each side. So this is just a side view we're looking at here. So this is the fallopian tube or uterine tube or oviduct, more than one name. And then that oviduct widens here to a funnel-shaped structure called the infundibulum. So the infundibulum, think of it as funnel. You know, it's a widened end. And it has these finger-like extensions called the fimbrae. And the fimbrae, when the ovary ovulates that secondary oocyte, the fimbrae waft that, that, o, that uh, secondary oocyte into the uterine tube, and it waits here for fertilization by sperm. Yes? So um, does fertilization take place both in the uterine and the uterine side? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah, yep, they go, so 50 per, or the half that went through the empty oviduct is out of luck, right? So there's that half reduction in number of sperm that can actually fertilize egg. Yes, good question. Okay, so secondary ovul, uh, oocyte is ovulated, fertilization occurs in that uterine tube, but it's one ovary or the other, like you mentioned. So not both ovaries are going to release that secondary oocyte, only one is released. Unless a person is over the age of 35, we see this increase just for a short period of time, like from 35 to 40-ish, we see this um, increased incidence of people ovulating two eggs per cycle. So and as a result, I mean, there's a lot of sperm there, right? So that means if there's two eggs there, each one can be fertilized by a separate sperm, and you have fraternal twins, which are non-identical twins. It's just two eggs that were ovulated fertilized by two different sperm, and they just happen to grow together in the uterus. So they're no more genetically alike than brothers and sisters born five years apart. Okay, so looking at some of the structures here, the uterus we're going to kind of zero in on because this becomes important for lab especially. So this is the uterine lining. The inner lining, which is a little paler in color here, is the endometrium. And the endometrium is the layer that attaches that newly fertilized egg and special structure we'll talk about in lab called the blastocyst that implants in the endometrium and, and stays there. If there's no fertilization that takes place, the endometrium is what is shed every month when a woman has her monthly cycle, when she has her period or menstruation. So that, that inner lining is shed. And some women, uh, it's a permanent form of birth control, it's a newer technique in the last 10 years maybe. Um, it's called an ablation, where they will um, use electricity, low voltage electricity, and zap the endometrium. So there's no opportunity or possibility for, you know, implantation to take place should pregnancy occur, and um, no menstrual periods because there's no endometrium to build up and be shed every month. So some women say it's, you know, been a, a great form of birth control and not having a period and not having to have any hormonal imbalances because they're just removing the endometrium and not using a, you know, an implant or the depo shot or oral pills. Yes? So how does that last? It's permanent. Yeah, they zap it down to the level that the cells that normally replace and regenerate and undergo mitosis, they're gone as well. So it's a permanent. Yes? No, they used to think that it's good for women to have a period every month. They, uh, the evidence now goes against that and saying that actually no, because when a person is pregnant, they're not shedding the endometrium for nine months. And a lot of the hormone pills uh, stim are, um, act like, stimulate the hor or not stimulate, um, resemble the hormones of levels that we see in pregnancy preventing the shedding of the you know, endometrial lining. But it also does some other things, too. It suppresses ovulation. Um, it also changes the cervical mucus, making it acidic and thicker. 
So there's a lot of different things that the different hormonal birth controls do to prevent pregnancy. Um, okay, so other things I wanted to mention. So the layers, then the endometrium is that where implantation occurs for the blastocyst or shedding during the menstrual period. And the myometrium is what contracts and forces baby out. So that thick muscular layer here is the myometrium and that causes uterine uh, cramping as well. So when a female is shedding the endometrial lining, um, that smooth muscle of the myometrium is also contracting and that can be painful for some women. And that's also what contracts when the prostaglandins from semen enter into the vaginal canal and into the uterus. But like I said, not a lot enters into the uterus. It's more, more in the vaginal canal. And don't underestimate the power of the myometrium because we think of smooth muscle, you know, not very strong. It's part of our digestive tract, but it can force a baby out through a, you know, a narrow opening, right? For those of you that have children, and a, you know, through that bony pelvis, it can push that baby out. So that those contractions of the myometrium are very strong. And if you've ever heard on, you know, TV or radio about people that have given birth, you know, in the back seat of the car right, or in the back of the cab because they just couldn't stop baby from descending down that birth canal. That's the power of the myometrium. So looking at estrogen then, what secretes estrogen? Estrogen? What are the cells of the ovary? What do we call this? So we have the Sertoli cells and the interstitial cells of the testes. What are the active players, the cells of the ovary that are doing the work of the ovary? follicle cells, yep. And there's different names of the follicle cells depending where they're located in the follicle. We're not going to go into that level of depth, but just know that it's the follicle cells that do that. So estrogen is secreted and eventually broken down, but estrogen can be stored in fat cells. So adipose, even though we didn't mention it as an endocrine gland, it has a lot of endocrine function because it plays a role in storing and when it's broken down, releasing testosterone and estrogen. So estrogen can be stored in the fat of females. So we know with obesity, what does that mean? Some breast cancers have estrogen receptors that support and nourish that breast cancer cell. So we know that um, high estrogen levels are not good for females. It can put them at risk for breast cancer and obesity puts women at risk for breast cancer. Not just having the fat cells, the, ex, the larger size fat cells, but actually the extra estrogen in the body as a result of that, if they have that BRCA gene, which stimulates breast cancer, or which uh, promotes breast cancer, and then we, women can get tested for that to see if they're at risk. Um, so then estrogen, so at puberty it causes growth of the breasts, causes increased the deposition of sub-Q fat on the hips as well. So the, the hips start to widen. Um, female athletes in high school, as they're finishing out puberty, start to gain a little bit of weight. They're, they become maybe not quite as fast as they were when they were younger and they had uh, less body fat on them. Um, we also said it's important for bone strength. Um, Promoting oogenesis, follicle growth, so we need estrogen to develop the, the egg every month, grow that follicle. And it's necessary to keep the vaginal canal moist, um, the uterus, and without estrogen, so after menopause and the cervical mucus, all of that is nourished by estrogen. So without estrogen after menopause, the, repro the female reproductive tract atrophies. So it becomes thin and it becomes dry and intercourse would become more difficult. So if you think about that, think of the damage that would occur in, a, in an elderly woman that's in a rape situation. They can die from that, literally. They can die from, from blood loss because the female reproductive tract at atrophies. And that's one of the reasons why people go on hormone replacement is because they don't want those negative side effects. But then we found that there are certain cancers related to being on hormone replacement therapy, so we don't encourage that anymore. Now we try to steer people away from hormone replacement. But there's other things we can do. There's um, creams, progesterone is the other hormone that nourishes and supports the reproductive tract. 
and some women use like progesterone creams to prevent that atrophy that occurs after menopause. So the difference between estrogen and testosterone during puberty, though, is that it's rapid. So the rapid growth spurt we see in girls compared to boys, if you look in a sixth grade classroom, you'll see the girls are taller than the boys, right? But then the girls stop. So estrogen acts on bone faster, stimulating that bone growth, but then it stops. Where testosterone acts on bone and boys slower but longer as a result. So boys finish growing about age 21 and girls finish growing about 18. And there's variation you know, where that big growth spurt happens. But in general, it um, goes on a little bit longer in males. So effects on metabolism for estrogen maintains low cholesterol. And so the, the bad cholesterol, the LDL, but the good cholesterol, the HDL, is maintained by estrogen and it facilitates calcium uptake, like I said, to keep your bones strong, and it stimulates bone cells to make more bone. So the side effects then after menopause, weak bones, high cholesterol, right? So these are reasons why women after menopause really have to work a little harder to get their body to maintain homeostasis through exercise and diet. So exercise and diet is very important for women after menopause. So progesterone then, like I said, works with estrogen to keep and nourish the uterus. It has a bigger influence on uterine health during pregnancy. So it quiets the uterus, because we don't want contractions occurring during pregnancy, right? We want to have a, a, a thick endometrial lining that's without contraction, and that is due to progesterone. Women that have early pregnancy losses Sometimes that's due to low progesterone, so they can replace that to, to keep those pregnancies going. And it also works on the breast to get it ready for lactation with the help of prolactin, right? Prolactin comes from the anterior pituitary. So progesterone and estrogen are two important hormones. And what other structure secretes progesterone? Yeah, the corpus luteum is another structure important for progesterone secretion, and that happens after fertilization has taken place, right? So if we look at this ovary here, a lot of different things we've seen already when we looked at gametogenesis. But the follicle cells here, so these are the cells of the follicle, so they surround and nourish this developing oocyte here. And these are the cells that secrete the hormones that we're talking about, estrogen. And the corpus luteum is just, remember, a remainder. It's a special structure that is developed from the follicle cells that ovulated that egg. So these follicle cells become the corpus luteum, which secretes progesterone. But then if, progest but then if fertilization doesn't happen, then that corpus luteum degenerates and becomes the corpus albicans, right, that white structure. So these are just de degenerated follicles. So looking at the processes in the ovary, we kind of talked about this already, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But remember that when does meiosis II complete? After fertilization. So it's stuck in metaphase two. So all the chromosomes are lined up in the middle of the cell. Then the sperm enters the egg and those chromosomes separate. When those chromosomes separate, there can sometimes be a breakage or um, loss of chromosome pieces in that pulling apart process. And that's where we see the chromosome problems happen. So the older the egg, we find the more likely to be, have those issues during that metaphase two after fertilization because they've been around for how long, those eggs? since fetal development of the female, right? So we have fragments of chromosomes or extra chromosomes. If we have an extra chromosome that was left behind, the spindle broke and left chromosome 21 in that cell that becomes baby, then now we have Down syndrome, and that's trisomy. <clears throat> and the other cell didn't get the chromosome 21, so we call that monosomy. They only, that zygote only has one copy of chromosome 21 instead of two. So that one wouldn't even, it wouldn't even develop and grow. So this process of finishing up meiosis is what leads some women to multiple miscarriages, is sometimes they have some uh, error in their DNA that was translated down the way. And we did this in lab, right? When you went from the, the, the mutated, or you went from the DNA to the mRNA to the protein, right? 
Um, if that damaged DNA is translated into the eggs, some women, all of their eggs have damaged DNA. So every time they get, and they have no trouble getting pregnant, man's sperm and semen is perfect, but every time they get pregnant, it doesn't result in a viable zygote or embryo, fetus and beyond, because the DNA is damaged and there's not that complete set of 46 chromosomes to result in a human being. So they have pregnancy loss after pregnancy loss. And depending what chromosomes are damaged, they may go a couple of weeks, right? It might be six, seven, eight weeks, and then they lose that pregnancy. But oftentimes it's because of DNA damage in that zygote, whether it happened after fertilization or it was in the eggs from birth, okay? Or from something, some exposure over a lifetime. So as we age, there's definitely less viable eggs every month. So a woman can try her hardest to get pregnant at 45 years old, but it's very unlikely to happen naturally even with artificial techniques like taking the egg out and fertilizing it in a petri dish like in vitro, still not gonna happen because those eggs are no longer viable at 45 years old. Now there are exceptions, right? But typically 45 and beyond, not likely to conceive naturally. Um, but what do the movie stars do, right? You read up the National Enquirer, oh, so-and-so is 50 years old, gave birth to twins, and then these women in the grocery line think, oh, I can still have a baby, I'm only 46, and I just got married to my wonderful husband, and we want to have a baby. Well, not likely. What they don't tell you, those movie stars, is they use donor eggs. So they used eggs from a younger person that were young and viable. Maybe they used their husband's sperm or their boyfriend's sperm and made those twins. And they could have implanted them in their fallopian tube as well and grew those babies. So they're pregnant, they look you know, like they're young and 50 years old with twins, but the, where they got those eggs from was not from themselves. It was from a donor, a younger, healthier donor. And if you investigate some of those actors and actresses that have conceived late in life as far as the female, um, it's donor eggs. Now, can women conceive at f in the early 40s? Yes, there's a big decline from the mid 40s and on, but the early 40s, 40s definitely yes. And I have a child at home <laughs> that was conceived um, when I was 42. So there you go. So there is decreasing fertility for sure as we age, but it's not doesn't mean you know a person is out of the woods. There's a lot of people that I've met in my experience in talking about it that had children, their last child in their early 40s. Anybody in here have someone they know that had a child over 40? My yes. Mom had a last I think she was 43. 43. Okay. 45. 45. Yeah. So that I remember you telling us that. Yeah, 45, and that's you know definitely on the very rare side, yeah. And there are some women that have conceived, you know, in their 50s, it does happen. You know, there's always variations, right? But in general, like if you go to a reproductive endocrinologist who does artificial, um, that's what it is, artificial insemination. Remember the syringe? <laughs> they just came to me. Um, yeah, intrauterine insemination, IUI, yeah. And it's a category of artificial insemination, yeah, yep. Yeah, um, anyway, um, I forgot what I was gonna say now. I remembered that, now I forgot what I was gonna say. Oh, shoot. What were we talking to just prior to that? Oh, reproductive, endoc thank you. Reproductive endocrinologists often will not do um, in vitro fertilization with a woman's own eggs if they're over like 42 or 43. It's just kind of a cutoff that they don't wanna waste their money because they know those eggs are not viable. Okay, so let's talk about the different cycles now. So the ovarian cycle, this process of taking an egg that's been there since fetal development and developing it and releasing it from the egg, from the ovary. So that happens at puberty. So when the first menstrual period occurs, we can say what happened two weeks earlier? Ovulation occurred two weeks earlier. So some girls that don't know their bodies and are experimenting with intercourse can get pregnant and say, I never even had my period. Well, you didn't give it a chance. You ovulated, sperm was there, and they conceived right away. So we see girls having babies 12, 13 years old. So, um, and women and girls enter puberty a little bit earlier nowadays because increased body fat that we see in our society because of our 
american diets, we see girls because of the higher estrogen levels, they're kicking into puberty at younger ages. so we're seeing again, pregnancies at younger ages. so that's why they're um kind of pushing and then just more intercourse too we see at younger ages and that's why they're pushing that um shot for the cervical cancer, the hpv, they're pushing that to younger ages now like nine, ten, eleven. they want to get girls immunized <coughs> and boys too. <coughs> so anyway, so during childhood there's small amounts of estrogens that are secreted and that inhibits GnRH from the hypothalamus. So we're not going to stimulate the ovaries during childhood. But then as puberty <coughs> draws near, we see GnRH released. <coughs> the mechanism that causes that at puberty is not described in your book, so that's beyond the scope of our class, so we're going to just take that at face value. <coughs> that's going to re release FSH and LH, and that acts on the ovaries. And then there's a hormone that comes from the fat tissue called leptin that also um, decreases the inhibition of um, the, the GnRH from the hypothalamus. So we said in childhood, estrogen inhibits GnRH release. But as girls gain a little weight, the hormone from that adipose tissue decreases that inhibition and makes it more likely for the menstrual period and the puberty to start. So girls that are a little heavier tend to enter puberty sooner than girls that are thinner. And that process occurs until menarch, menarche, and that's the stoppage of menstrual flow. Okay, so the different phases of the ovary then. The first phase of the woman's cycle that affects the ovary is called the follicular phase. So during this time, this is when we see the increase of the follicle into that mature follicle. And the follicular phase ends with ovulation. So if you look at the process of what's occurring in the ovary, the primary oocyte is developing and it ends with ovulation. So, the first, so there's 28 days in the cycle. The first two weeks of a, so 28 days divided into two periods of 14 days, roughly. So the first half of the cycle is the follicular phase, and it's just developing that follicle, and then it ends with ovulation. Then the, uter the ovarian wall ruptures, and the secondary oocyte is released, and sometimes two are released. But that can cause some pain at the surface of the ovary, which is called middle schmerz or middle pain because ovulation occurs in the middle of the cycle and women might find they feel a dull ache on one side or the other right about the level of the hip. And that is normal, that's ovulation pain. And it usually lasts about six to 12 hours. Ovulation is a brief you know, episode and then it's over and six to 12 hours of pain aching on one side or the other. So maybe you or someone you know has experienced that. So then the ovary enters into what's called the luteal phase, because what is forming now? After the egg is popped out, what does the, fo the follicle cells form? The corpus luteum. So that's why this is called the luteal phase. So, Because there's a couple of, you have to know four different phases. We're going to talk about the uterine cycle next. So just remember, the ovary has the follicle. So there's the follicular phase, and the follicle becomes the corpus luteum. So that's the luteal phase. So we can keep those two straight. So after ovulation, the corpus luteum starts to secrete progesterone and estrogen. So FSH and LH, after ovulation, are acting on the corpus luteum, not on the follicle. They're acting on the corpus luteum, causing it to stimulate progesterone and estrogen. Prior to that, where did FSH and LH act on? To get estrogen. What? The follicle, yeah, the follicle. So after that, it's the corpus luteum, which is the follicle, right? So just continuing that process. So within 10 days, we'll see the corpus albicans, but if pregnancy occurs, then it continues on. The corpus luteum continues on. You see a, sometimes a small cyst on the surface of the ovary. So in this phase, we're going to not want to develop another ovary, right? So we have a combination of, and this is in your notes pages on the bottom of the 
notes for this slide. Progesterone, estrogen, and inhibin is another hormone that we already talked about. That's going to suppress GnRH secretion and stop the process of developing follicles. So that's where the birth control comes in, is if we have the right combination of progesterone and estrogen, that inhibits development of the follicle and prevents ovulation. So if we prevent ovulation, obviously we're preventing pregnancy, right? And that's how the, the different hormonal uh, birth controls work. So if we look at the phase across the, the 28 days, the blue represents the follicular phase, the green is the luteal phase. What do we see happen? What hormone surges is at its highest level right before ovulation? LH. LH is necessary for ovulation. Without LH, no ovulation will occur. So some women use ovulation test kits that test for ovulation, or test for LH, and they test their uh, morning urine, and once they get a positive, they know they're gonna ovulate within the next 24 to 48 hours. So they wanna time intercourse during that time to make sure that the egg is there when sperm is there, because sperm can live in the reproductive tract of the female for up to five days, but the egg is only viable for about 24 hours. So timing is really important. So this is just a summary then of the phases of the ovarian cycle, or of the ovarian cycle. So we have the follicular phase with ovulation and then the luteal phase. And depending on pregnancy takes place, at the end of the luteal phase, we're either gonna see a corpus luteum actively secreting progesterone and estrogen, or we're gonna see the corpus albicans if fertilization did not take place. So this just shows some hormonal control of what's happening here. So what are the hormones that inhibit GnRH? So what two hormones inhibit GnRH? Estrogen and, is that listed on there? Yes, yep, on the right side, in the second half. Right, in the second half it does, by the corpus luteum. Yep, and what other hormone? There's three, inhibin. Yep, so we don't wanna develop more oocytes if we have an active corpus luteum. That means pregnancy took, is starting. And early in the process, it's just inhibin and estrogen because we're already developing a follicle in the first half of the phase, and we don't want to start developing another one. So those hormones inhibit GnRH. Do they act, does anything act on FSH and LH? If you look at this diagram. Well, the LH surge is going to stimulate ovulation there at step number six on the right-hand side. So we can see the LH surge here. But if we decrease GnRH, we're gonna decrease FSH and LH, right? But we also see direct inhibition as well on the anterior pituitary from inhibin and those estrogens. So now we'll talk about the uterine cycle. So the three phases of the uterine cycle, so there's two phases of the ovarian cycle, the follicular phase and the luteal phase. In the uterine cycle, now we're talking about what's happening to that endometrial lining during the same time that we were looking at the ovaries. So the ovaries are over there, now we're talking about the uterus, the lining of the uterus, what's happening there at the same time. So the first five days of the cycle, days one through five during that follicular phase of the ovary, the endometrial lining is breaking down from the previous cycle. So this is the menstrual phase. So days one through five are when active bleeding is occurring. So that endometrial lining is being shed. Then days six through 14, that endometrial lining is building up. Because don't we wanna have a nice, fluffy, happy place for that <laughs> fertilized ovum to implant? So once we shed it for the first five days, now we're gonna build it up and make sure, and my daughter took a class you know, in sixth grade about puberty, and they talked about getting the nursery ready and hanging the curtains and then tearing it all down when baby doesn't come. And that's kind of what the uterine lining is doing. So we're, we're setting up the nursery in the first half of the cycle, and then the second half, we're getting rid of it because 
pregnancy did not occur. So days one through five is menstrual, six through 14 is the proliferative when we're building up the cycle. So, or building up the, I'm sorry, building up the uterus. So we're building up the uterus here, providing a nourishing environment for that blastocyst. Ovulation occurs, and then again, if fertilization occurs after ovulation, then we're gonna continue to build up that lining, and it's gonna stay that way all the way up until baby's born. But if we did not, fertilize that ovum or secondary oocyte, then it starts to break down and the cycle starts over. After day 28, now we're back at days one through five again. So if fertilization does not occur, no corpus luteum, progesterone levels are gonna fall. And why do they fall? Someone said it, I heard it, a mumbling. The corpus luteum is gone, right? The corpus luteum is breaking down. That's the source of the progesterone in the second half of the cycle, right? So then without progesterone, the spiral arteries kink and spasm in that, in that endometrium, and that causes no blood supply to those endometrial cells, and they die. And then the spiral arteries constrict, and then they relax and open wide. And what happens when arteries are open? Bleeding occurs, right? So then the bleeding occurs. And then the rush of the blood fragments, capillary beds, that functional layer of those cells is what's shed with the menstrual period. So this just summarizes both of the cycles together and kind of tells you what hormones are acting in each phase, which are primary, right? The primary hormones that are active in each phase. And then the uterine cycle tells you the days. So just about done here. I know this is a marathon lecture today because of the exam. So bear with me if you need to use a restroom or whatever, just go. But anyway, um, let's just quick talk about what makes a person male or female. So developmental aspects. So the ovaries and testes are up in the pelvic, in the upper middle abdomen, I should say. And then they slowly descend during fetal development. But for females, there's a ligament at the pelvis that prevents them from going outside the body, like in the males, with, where with males, those gonads descend into the scrotum and are outside the body. So when we determine if a baby is male or female, it depends on what egg and what sperm came together, right, at fertilization. So males have the X from their mother and they inherited the Y from their father, and that's what makes them male. So females are two X's, so they got an X from dad and an X from mom, and they have two X's in their, 20, that's the 23rd pair, right, two X's. So if we look at sperm and egg, all the female sperm are X, and then for males, half are X, half are Y. We talked about that with the genetics lab last week. So this Y chromosome is what determines maleness. So absence of a Y chromosome means a person's going to be female. So there's a gene, the Y chromosome is very small. If you remember when I showed you that slide last week, it's very small. And there's the gene, the, the important gene on there is the SRY gene. And that's what stimulates the testes to develop and the secondary sex characteristics of the male, so development of the penis. So there's a period of time, though, during embryonic development where there we can't tell if it is a male or female. We call it the, the sexually indifferent stage, which means there's, there's the reproductive tract in males and the reproductive tract in females, and they're both present at this five to six week stage. So looking at this diagram here, the Wolfian ducts here will is the tissue that will develop into the male reproductive tract. And the malarian ducts, which are right alongside, will develop into the female reproductive tract. So we're talking about the tract. So we're talking about vagina, uh, cervix, uterus, the tract, the, the, the passageways, right? So this is different than the genitals. The external genitals come from the same tissue. Do the, do the ducts come from the same tissue, the tracts? No. Malarian ducts? the paramesonephric, I prefer to say malaria, it's easier to say. The malarian duct is gonna become female. The wolfian ducts will develop into male, but there are different ducts present at the five to six week embryo. 
when we go to look at the external genitalia, those come from the same tissue. But again, one is influenced by the Y, the SRY gene, and if, if SRY gene is not there, then it becomes female. So the female characteristic is the default, and we'll talk about that. So this is the male then. If the SRY gene is present, which is on the Y chromosome, the malarian ducts degenerate and break down. So that's what these are. They're degenerating and breaking down. And what remains, the Wolfian ducts develop into these epididymis and eventually the rest of the tract of the, of the male. So this becomes the epididymis and the um, ductus deferens and so on if the SRY gene is present. So in the female, without SRY gene, we see a degenerating of the Wolfian ducts and the malarian ducts develop and then we start to see the uterine tube and the uterus develop. So what stimulates this whole process is testosterone. So if the SRY gene is present, we have testosterone secretion from the early testes of the male, but that, that testosterone, the presence of that testosterone causes this process of the Wolfian um, duct to remain and the malarian ones to degenerate. So without testosterone, then the opposite occurs and we get the female. And it makes sense if you think about it because if we said estrogen caused the female stuff to form, that wouldn't make sense because where is this fetus right now? In a female, is she secreting estrogen during this time? Yes. So everybody would be female if it was estrogen that we were relying on to be female because mother's female. So it's testosterone that determines if the baby's gonna go the male route or the female route. So everything starts out indifferent. We're, we're primed for both. But if testosterone is present due to the testes that form, then that will degenerate and become, the, the female part will degenerate and become male. Yes? So how does the duct hermaphrodite Good question. Yeah, that's where you have both parts. So typically hermaphrodites are, and I don't know where this, there's, there's some testosterone secretion that causes this development, right, of the male parts, but there's enough estrogen to make it female as well, because what we see in most hermaphrodites, they have ovaries and a uterus, but they have male um, genitalia. So there's something with the influence of testosterone causing this, and I, I don't know what causes it specifically, but I do know in most cases they are female internally, male externally. Okay, so um, looking at the external genitalia then, there's different tissues, and you don't need to know the tissues, but just know, all I want you to know is the related parts. So the, pen the tissue that forms the penis of the male is the same tissue that forms the clitoris of the female. Both contain spongy tissue. Both become erect when stimulated. Urethral folds form the urethra of the male and the labia minora of the female. So that's the inner, darker colored folds of the female external genitalia. And then the labial scrotal folds form the scrotum of the male and the labia majora of the female. So these tissues are the same, even though they have totally different appearances in male or female. So the key concept that you might see on a lab exam, one is the SRY gene, what does it do? Another one is the ducts of the reproductive tract come from separate tissues, come from separate structures, right? but the external genitalia come from the same tissues, male or female. So that is a key kind of concept to draw from that. So what we see with the males is the, the testes descend about two months before birth. Some baby boys are born with testicles that did not descend. And in the show world of animals, for those of you that are farmers or maybe show cattle or whatever, that's something they look at. They should see two well-descended test testes for something to be considered a, a, a prime animal for you know, reproductive purposes because 
Um, when the testes haven't fully descended, sometimes that's linked to problems with um, fertility or increased risk for cancer in the male. So that's something that is definitely um, followed early on after birth to make sure that those testes descend or they correct it surgically. So again, men can produce children all throughout life, but testosterone levels do go down, but sperm production is there. So there are people that have conceived children in their 80s. But women are down around age 50. The ovaries no longer develop an egg every month. So estrogen levels decline, right? Because if the ovaries are non-functional, then there's no follicle cells to secrete that estrogen. The only estrogen in a female's body is whatever is stored in her body fat, but no more estrogen from the follicle. And then um, FSH levels, like we said, will increase for a while, right? Because they're trying to stimulate those ovaries because estrogen levels are declining. But we're not going to see um, long-term elevation because, again, if, if there's no stimulation occurring, then those levels of FSH and LH will drop down over time as well. But during this process of decreased estrogen, the body responds with a lot of symptomology during the menopausal period until it, it develops a new set point. So women experience hot flashes, depression, anxiety, thinning of the hair, fat, deposits differently, fat deposits more around the middle, where women tend to be you know, more pear-shaped and having fat around, the, around the, the legs and the buttocks. It starts to develop around the middle. Picture your grandmas. Think of your grandmas at the, at the stove. Don't they kind of round around the middle, <laughs> right? Well, not everybody, but um, that's kind of an estrogen thing. When estrogen levels decline, the fat redistributes on the female body. Um, but as far um, as some of the other things we see, like you know, slower metabolism, a lot of that is activity related. You know, the metabolism slows a bit, but it's not all after menopause, everything goes to pot. It's if women stay active, eat healthy, get proper rest, you know, take care of themselves, you know, people can be very active in their 50s and 60s, you know, and after menopause and, and do just fine. So some women have more trouble than others. And oftentimes it depends on the mother. It kind of runs in families about how people deal with menopause. But some of the worst scenarios are for some of you that are in your 20s right now, you know, or a couple of years ago when you were in your teens, you have girls in their teens going through puberty and you have moms going through menopause. So think of the poor men in those families. 